I know most of the people, well, AC, I just met you. So and I know most of the others on here. So welcome, everybody. Um, for those that are going to be watching this on YouTube, um, just a little overview. So this is Passive Cash Flow for Life, uh, Teaching Tuesdays. Thanks so much for attending or for watching. Um, this whole uh, process uh, came about um, with Nicole Amundsen, who is on now. Um, and uh, she started investing in commercial real estate 26 years ago, I think. That might be right. Mm -hmm. 26 right. years ago. And has had tremendous success um, across the country, uh, just buying lots and lots of stuff and um, being very successful at running her properties, uh, whether it be, sing or I guess single families where she started, but whether it be um, apartment buildings or mobile home parks or self-storage, she's pretty much done it all. And then about 11 years ago, 12 years ago, something like that, she started teaching kind of as a give back. Um, about eight or nine years ago, I took her class. It was phenomenal. Um, and we ended up getting along. We ended up partnering. And uh, here we are, you know, nine years later, about a year and a half ago, we started teaching Tuesdays, which is basically an opportunity to bring experts in the field um, to kind of talk about um, what's happening in the industry. Um, what are some tips and tricks to help you be more successful? Um, and then sometimes Nicole teaches on specific other subjects. Sometimes I teach. Um, we just try and bring the best value we possibly can. And our hope, obviously, is that uh, you find enough value that you choose to, A, use whoever we bring on as the expert, and B, you get a little bit of a taste of multifamily and decide, you know something, this looks really interesting. I'll go ahead and sign up for the class because these guys are fantastic. So anyway, I kind of leave it at there. So Steve Loray, um, longtime friend, he has been uh, in the area for a very long time, been doing um, insurance for 32 years. So obviously he started when he was like 12, right? So, um, but he's been doing it for a very long time, very successful, very well known, um, specifically among the investor community in the Baltimore area um, and has grown to the point where they actually write um, coverage um, in every state in the country. So not only does he have local experience, but he's got national experience. And with everything that's going on now with insurance and all the craziness that you've heard about, um, I think he's the perfect person to actually come in and teach us a little bit about what's going on, what recommendations he has, and obviously the ability for us to ask him questions um, about uh, different things. So, Steve, thank you very much for being here. It's all yours. All right. So let's hop in. I'll give you some background on me. There's something, you know, where James, uh, you know, uh, fill in some blanks. So I actually started as an accountant, a public accountant. Um you know, I can't say I'm a CPA anymore because I, I don't keep an active license, but I passed the exam um, and practiced for a bunch of years, um, but absolutely hated accounting. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I kept looking at my insurance agent and you know, we could all laugh. He would show up at 10 o'clock every day and he'd be leaving at two. And I'm like, oh my God, this is the laziest guy I've ever seen. Um, but you know what he was doing really well. And I said, a guy like me who's smart with numbers, you know, I just you know, wound up getting into property and casualty insurance. And I love it. I've always loved it, you know, since I've been in it um, and, and happy to be here. So uh, as we were going along, I started as a nationwide insurance agent um, 32 years ago, um, you know, and started getting involved in some things nationwide didn't do. So uh, Alex Cooper auctioneers used to have the auctions uh, when, you know, a lot of people that I knew were selling off large amounts of rental properties. And just, they were getting out of the market back in the day. And so Alex Cooper, you know, once a month would have an auction doing a hundred properties and they were doing this every month. So they, at the back, very similar to what, you know, what, what James is doing here, you know, they would have a some boost in the back of people they trusted and knew that were good. And they'd have a title company. They'd have a, you know, some a lenders, they'd have uh, me in there doing insurance. Uh, and then this was 20 years ago. And that's how I started. And we, you know, at that time, people were buying rental properties. We were doing the rental properties. Some were vacant. They needed builder's risk insurance. You know, that's how we got into builder's risk, doing lots of builder's risk. Um, you know, then it got into people buying multifamily properties and we got into, you know, multifamilies. And, you know, what I call, you know, the strange stuff. Um, when people think of multifamily sometimes, um, you know, they think of really just an apartment building. And that's not necessarily the case. It's, it's more to it than that. Um, to give you an example, um, we had, uh, and, and Nicole will love this, uh, you know, seven, eight years ago, we had a customer call that was buying a marina. And on the marina, they had garages that they rented out. They also had an apartment building there. 
Um, now, long story short, we were able to get that done. It was very hard, but we got it done with one insurance carrier. Um, you know, but here it is, it's a marina. So we actually wrote that on a marina insurance policy to get that one done. Um, because there's uh, the exposures with the boats and the docks and all kinds of fun stuff like that. Um, another thing that, you know, we're getting calls lately, uh, people buying trailer parks is another, another one I know Nicole loves. Uh, sometimes when they buy trailer parks, um, more often than not, trailer parks are great because if somebody calls you in the middle of the night and the pipe is broken, it's not your problem because you don't own the trailer, you just own the park and they're great. They're great investment vehicles, uh, but sometimes you buy them and the people that own the park may own six or seven or eight trailers in the in the park. So there you have a multifamily exposure, you know, of different uh, different uh, uh, units that are of different ages, and we have to you know play with those and and things like that. Um, and then we get into, you know, something uh, more just standard, you know, what I call the apartment building. Um, you know, you can think of anything, you know, uh, insurance carriers, we break it down into one to four families. And then in anything over four families is considered commercial and has to go, you know, on a different policy. So if it's anything from one, two, three, four units, those can go sometimes commercial, but they can also go on a, a dwelling package a dwelling fire, maybe we can save money that way, doing it that way. Uh, some of my carriers are a little bit more limited. Sometimes I can't get a million dollars of liability. I can only get 500,000. But, you know, sometimes we can go get an umbrella if we need it. Um, we're seeing a lot of mixed use coming here. What do I mean by mixed use? You bought a building that maybe has three, four, five apartments, um, but on the first floor, is a doctor's office, is an attorney's office, is some sort of commercial on the first floor. Um, we see that up and down Charles Street. We see that up in, you know, in Baltimore City, Calvert Street, Preston Street. You know, as you go up and down there, uh, you know, it's not uncommon to find, you know, first floor commercial, zoned RO, residential office with, with multifamilies upstairs. Um, and again, it can be, you know, extremely lucrative. Uh, we're going to underwrite and look at the first floor, who your, you know, what commercial tenant is on the first floor. So is it, you know, something that makes sense that easy, maybe some sort of office. Um, but if it's something, you know, a, a restaurant with a, you know, deep fryer and all kinds of stuff, that's going to be much, much harder and much more expensive to insure. So, you know, it depends what you have on the first floor. Um, I wrote a big, um, absolutely beautiful renovated building in Hagerstown. Um, absolutely great building, completely renovated. But, um, you know, it had a bit of a restaurant exposure on the first floor. How do we get it done? It turns out it, it was more of a bakery and a breakfast place with, with muffins and coffee. And they didn't have a deep fryer. All they had, you know, was, was ovens to cook stuff and they had microwaves. So there was no, there was no fryer, there was no grill. Um, and we were able to want, oh, it took a lot of work, but we got it done, um, knock on wood. So, uh, you know, that's how we wind up getting that done. So, um, gonna switch, you know, so in our case here, you know, as we get questions on mixed use, again, it's, it's, hey, what's on that first floor? Or is the first floor vacant? I have one right now uh, that we wrote, um, but, the carrier decided that they didn't want it because even though the four apartment units upstairs were rented, the problem we had is the first floor office space is vacant. And they just didn't like the fact it was vacant because they didn't know what could move in there. So, uh, you know, for instance, you know, what if a bar, something with a liquor license moved in, you know, that could be an issue. Uh, what if a, a CBD store or something selling cannabis moved in? You know, that takes it from what we call standard carrier. I, I can't write it anymore because they're legally filed that cannabis is excluded in their products and and they have to cancel it. So uh, I, I wrote one uh, a few weeks ago that had a, uh, a convenience store on the first floor, well run with a little deli and some habitational upstairs. 
Um, then they went to do out the inspection. So this was a new purchase. Uh, the new owners bought it from the existing owner. What did they put in? Now they're selling hookahs, okay, out of the blue. And uh, as you go drive by, they sent me a picture of, of something with, with a picture of the hookahs that are for sale. All of a sudden, it made it ineligible, okay? It's no, the carrier wanted off the risk because, you know, you're selling hookahs. Does that mean you're selling CBD? Does that mean, you know, all that kind of stuff? It now makes it ineligible for our standard program. Um, so they changed what they were doing, if that makes sense. Um, we always want to make sure in this day and age that your tenants have insurance. Huge. They burn down the place. You know, there's some liability we can go after. Um, does the If it's a mixed use, does that restaurant on the first floor or whoever, the mixed use tenant, do they have insurance and they're making you, the landlord, an additional insured on the policy. Something happens. Um, there's a trip and fall, you know, maybe their insurance is primary and that they have to handle it. So you can we get something called a primary and non-contributory endorsement on their policy? So they have to handle everything that happens first, if that makes sense. Uh, but we really, really want to get tenants to make sure they get renters insured. So the, some of the big national landlords, if you want to rent an apartment from them, their apartment building, you have to get renters and shorts. They won't even give you a key without it. You, you've got to have renters and shorts, um, period. And that also helps with dog bites. If you're out, you know, we, we'll get into a whole discussion about dog bites tonight. Oh my God, what a mess. Um, but, you know, let's discuss, I want to get into apartments. You know, I get, a, I'm getting, um, you know, we get calls every day from all over, all over the place from, um, you know, all kinds of apartment buildings, big, small, it, and it first starts with location. Um, AC, we talked about your stuff being in the county. The county is going to be much easier and give us much more opportunity than the city. Baltimore City right now um, is challenged. I've had several carriers go on moratorium, meaning they will not write in Baltimore City. Um, or they placed, uh, you know, right now I've got a carrier that will write, but I'm going to need... Uh, I'm going to need pictures of the front, the back, both sides. If you can get me a picture of the roof, I need a roof, you know, maybe a roof shirt. To, we'll talk about the roofs in a bit, you know. And last but not least, I'm going to need a picture of your circuit breaker box. I want to confirm that there's not fuses. I want to confirm that it's an updated circuit box with, you know, hopefully 100 amp service. Um, too many, you know, people who have these old boxes um, they're missing breakers, they're fuses. Uh, so they want to see your electric now. Um, so so Baltimore City is doable, but you're going to pay more for Baltimore City. It's just the way it is right now. Um, you know, had a trip and fall lawsuit from a client, you know, recently that came in. Um, person said, uh, you know, oh, they were studying nursing and they, they couldn't get into their classes. So they'd like to be reimbursed for the whole semester. You know, um, so they want, they're filing a lawsuit for their their school expenses for a semester. Um, just crazy what we see. Um, so carriers are, are now, what's important? So the first thing, you know, when I call you, fine. Hey, how are we doing this? What's the OLC? We get the information. First thing I'm going to ask you is the updates. When's the roof updated? When's the HVAC updated? When is the electric updated when and, and about your plumbing. First things we're going to talk about because every insurance carrier is going to ask me those four questions. So as you're buying the unit, the same thing. What conditions the roof in? My carriers now are using, I'm going to call them AI, but drone technology. Okay. They can use Google Earth to zero down on your individual roof. Now, occasionally do they get one wrong? And I say, you got the wrong roof. It's the one next door. Sure. But now they're looking at roofs saying, hey, this is a bad roof. We're not going to buy a claim. You need to go put a new roof on or, or we're getting off the risk. We don't want it. So we're not going to be um, paying for a lot of new roofs these days. So I had a carrier, I had a client that had a, a, a claim on the roof. Okay, the roof was in bad shape to begin with. Uh, the insurance company, you know, sent an adjuster out, did, a, did an estimate. 
and offered a settlement to repair the, you know, that portion of the roof that was damaged. Then I get a call from a roofer. How dare you? They need a whole new roof. You know, you need to pay for a whole new roof. And the estimate you said, um, you know, that's not an MHC, MHIC license. That's not a certified license. I'm going to file a complaint and turn you over to the MHIC. I said, I said, sir, that's great. File your complaint all day long. It's an insurance adjuster cost estimate on your roof. It's not an MHIC, you know, estimate to begin with. And it doesn't have to be. Okay. It's just an insurance estimate on what it costs to repair the roof. Okay. It's not done by a licensed contractor to begin with. The um anyway, as you can tell, the the roofer wanted to, he wanted to be paid by the insurance company to put a whole new roof on. But the whole roof didn't need to be replaced, just a small damaged area that was damaged from a storm. But he was getting my client upset. Oh, you need a new roof. I don't want to, you know, whole mess. Company's not going to pay for a whole new roof for you these days. Okay, unless, you know, it's something, you know, it's absolutely shot, whether it was a fire. Hail's going to be real sketchy these days on those. Um, you know, but something, you know, to talk about. But as I said, on roofs, we're going to look at your roof up front. If you've got uh, water spots or you've, you're missing shingles, okay, we're going to have a talk because it's, you know, uh, you might get ACV on your roof. It's not going to be a replacement cost. It's going to be depreciated. I've got carriers doing that now. Uh, but we're really going to look at your roof and the carrier is going to be looking at your roof. It, 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 there's no hiding it anymore, anymore. So Jane will like this story. So I recently switched my own home insurance in Florida. Okay. Um, when I switched my home insurance in Florida, um, I had, number one, had to replace my hot water heater. There was nothing wrong with my hot water heater to begin with. They weren't fine. But it was 16 years old, and they would only insure it if it was 15 years or younger. So I went to Home Depot and put in a new hot water heater to get new homeowner's insurance that was a lot less. Then they came out to do the inspection. Guy literally pulls a drone out of his car, flies it up, snaps the pictures, brings it down. And luckily, they, they like my roof. Uh, my roof was only 16 years old and that passed, thank God. Um, but, you know, that's what's going on, you know, for instance, down there with roofs. Um, the condo community next to where I lived literally replaced their whole roofs so they knew they wouldn't have an issue getting insurance uh, from all the condominiums that lived there. Uh, they spent a million dollars replacing the roofs. Um, but they'll be able to get condo insurance because it's all brand brand new state of the art roofs. Uh, so roofs are a big topic these days. The other thing we're going to look at, if you've got three or more steps, do you have a handrail to get in the building? Big one. Okay. And you'll say, um, I mean, that's code. That's Baltimore city code. There's just, you know, not a lot there. You either have it or you don't. And if you don't, we're going to require you to put it in and the carrier may want off the risk because that's Baltimore city code. Um, another one we're going to look at is fire extinguishers in your building. And if you have fire extinguishers, do you have a service contract? So, so, so here in my office, we use, it's called BFPE. And they're great. They charge me about $50 a year. They come in, they make sure it's, it's working and, and they tag it and they give me a tag fresh for another year. Usually within a few weeks of that, the fire department shows up, does its annual inspection and sees that my stuff is properly tagged and, uh, you know, move on to the next one. So uh, we're going to check to see if you have fire extinguishers are they tagged? You know, some cases it just makes sense for my clients every year to go out to Home Depot and buy brand new fire extinguishers because they're cheap. You know, good new fire extinguishers, 25, 30 bucks. It's not crazy. And then they could send me the receipt to show they paid for it. They'll tend to send a picture. By the way, um, also carbon monoxide detectors were look that's come up recently. Um, we have one insurance carrier send us something that they, you know, there's not a carbon monoxide uh detector on every floor. I'm like, but that's not the requirement. It's either you have a carb one carbon monoxide detector or not. It doesn't say it needs to be on every floor. We were able to get that waived because I knew the guys, I knew the policy better than the underwriter. <laughs> so uh, we were able to get that little provision waived. Uh, but we're going to look at carbon monoxide. We're going to look at fire extinguishers. 
Uh, if you've got a sprinkler system, you know, we'll talk about that. Um, smoke detectors, absolutely got to have them at least, you know, and are they checked? You know, does the property manager come in at least check them annually? Um, Hardwired's better, obviously. Um, you know, we want to make sure that if there's a fire, somebody could get to it and at least try to put it out before it gets too far. Um, commercially, uh, Section 8, this comes up all the time. Um, some of my carriers are okay with it. Some are not. I think it's, uh, you know, I tell my carriers, you know, I have really good what I call loss history, loss experience from Section 8. A, my carriers, uh, my customers know they're going to get better rents and the rents are going to come in the first of the month. So when they rehab, they rehab to a Section 8 standard. They know the Section 8, the back of their hand. So when the Section 8 com inspector comes in to give it a voucher, you know, they can show them everything. This code, here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is. Oh, great. Here. Now, the cool thing about that is that a, typically a HUD you know, voucher will um, program. They're going to come inspect that every year to make sure the, the unit is still in compliance. So I say to my, my carriers, I don't understand what your problem is with Section 8. A third party is going to come by every year to make sure that house is in really good condition. And if it's in good condition, um, you know, they allow it to stay in the voucher program. My, my clients don't want to be off the program. But, you know, the ones who really understand Section 8 love it. Not all my insurance carriers love Section 8, but but I'm telling you, they perform pretty well. Um, and I really don't have a lot of losses in, in that. Um, so, um, you know, anyway, it's important. Um, also a multifamily, this is uh, something uh, we're getting a lot of lately. People that are renting to, I don't want to call them government programs, but silver living houses or, you know, an alpha comes in and rents your five bedroom house and puts 10 people living in there as part of a program. Okay, well, we can call it a sober living house. We can call it, uh, you know, if, right after they've been uh, released from um, rehab or drug rehab or something like that, they enter, you know, that kind of home. Um, but there's all kinds of different classes of business there. That does require a little bit of specialized insurance uh, to get done. Uh, please keep that in mind. You know, at that point, it's really being rented to 10 people, It's you know, kind of thing. Um, it's not a single family house necessarily anymore. Um, and your tenant is a is a corporation that's rent, you know renting out to several people, uh, typically with a uh, house manager maybe living in the basement of their own room. Uh, so you know that's what we get. Um, but again, it can be a very lucrative form of multi property you know landlording. Um, sometimes you know typically get higher rents from those. Um, but please keep in mind, you know, government subsidized Section 8, market tenants, certainly easier um, kind of thing. Um, you know, as you buy these, we're going to talk about loss runs. Hey, can you find out any losses? You know, has there been a recent fire? The building, I'm, some buildings I'm working on this week um, were built in 1992 because the old buildings burned down. So uh, I've got 30-year-old buildings that are in excellent shape. Um, and I've got multiple carriers looking to insure those and it's in the county. Um, what else do we have? Multi-properties. Um, like I said, there's, there's, you know, um, what's going on in different parts of the country. If you, if you're, if you're here and you're thinking about Texas, Texas, it's all, you know, about mold and stuff. Um, and what goes on down there, Texas, a bit of a problem. If you're along the, the coast, um, Florida, especially, is wind challenged. Louisiana has wind issues down there, too. Um, here in Maryland, you'll love this. I have um, a carrier that's decided that, uh, you know, Baltimore, Baltimore City, Baltimore County is in a wind zone and that it's it's coastal. I said, I, I'm 180 miles door to door, three hour drive to get to Ocean City, Maryland. But, oh, you're near the Chesapeake Bay. I'm like, Okay, you know, 20 minutes, 20 miles, but they've decided it's coastal. <laughs> their, their underwriting syndicates that back the insurance paper decided the Chesapeake Bay is coastal. Go figure. Um, so we deal with that. So, you know, we get this. Um, if you're looking at it, you're looking at your current bill and your bill has doubled or tripled. 
you know, we had a carrier as of uh, July 1st last year without any notice, doubled their rates in Baltimore City, sometimes tripled. Without notice, their 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 people who backed the paper just, you know, Philly, Baltimore, Atlanta, the, the rates went up crazy. So if that happens, fine. Maybe it's time to, you know, look for a new carrier. Hey, Steve, what can you do? Um, what do you have? My carrier's done, you know, blank. You know, um, hey, this has gone way up. You know, well, hey, let's see. You know, so carriers are doing a few things now. Very interesting. Some have filed with the state for, you know, say uh, they filed for a 40% rate increase. And if it's what we call an admitted carrier and they fall under the Maryland Insurance Administration, the Maryland Insurance Administration may come back and say, hey, we're not going to allow you to take 40%. We're only giving you, based on what we can see, 20%. The insurance carrier says, okay, because they're on, you know, that's all they can do. So how do they get a higher rate? So then they start looking at your property and saying, hey, this is a 4,000 square foot property and it's only insured for say 150 a foot. It's only insured for six or 700,000. We need 250 a foot now. So we're going to insure your property at Renewal. We've run a new replacement cost guide and we need a million dollars of insurance on that property right now um, at the new rates. So that's how they get to their 40%. Uh, they've took your property and they raised the replacement cost. Now, what's happened in the market? We know that, that the price of lumber has gone up dramatically, the price of stone, the price of, of electric, you, you name it, it's all gone up 20%. So the carriers um, are all losing money on this property line of business, on this, on this multifamily property. Because uh, what they're finding is that a lot of the properties are, in fact, underinsured. So when I call here enough, get people, oh, you know, I can replace that, Steve, for $100 a foot. No, you can't. Yes, I can. You know, okay. Uh, you're not going to get replacement cost. I don't have a carrier that's going to do that. So let's talk about something called agreed value. If you want $100 a foot, I'll sell you a policy for $100 a foot, but it's going to be on something called an agreed value basis. And I'm going to make you sign something up front that you understand that we agreed up front that this is what we're going to insure for. So say in this case, it's a Baltimore City row house and you only want to insure for $100,000. You bought it for 20, you put 80 into it, you're in for it for 100. That's all you want insured. You're not going to pay a penny more than that. So we actually have a carrier that's an agreed value. So it's going to be a replacement cost up to the 100. But if it's 140,000 to fix that property, they stop at 100. You're on the hook for your next 40. So it's agreed value. We're going to agree up front how much we're going to insure that for. Um, and some people want that and they're happy with that and they're okay with that. And, uh, you know, it's available if it's something you want. Um, we looked at a, a case that came in today. Um, the mom passed away and it is it is 10 different houses. Now, as we discussed, AC, they're all next to each other. Okay. it's uh, They're not attached but they're all next to each other, kind of the shape of a horseshoe. Um, and the family's owned this apparently for years. Nobody knows when the last time the electric has been updated, the roof's been updated. Okay, we're not going to be able to get, and, and the family's going to try to take out a, a mortgage on this to do a whole lot of stuff. The problem is, not you know, they're asking me the same questions I told you we were going to ask. And nobody knows the answer to these questions is the issue. We're not going to be able to get replacement cost on this property. We'll be lucky to get actual cash value, which is a depreciated insurance amount on the properties if the house is burned down um, or they have claims because nobody seems to know anything about these, these properties. Um, you know, um, but they're trying to, you know, you know, get a substantial loan. So I mean, this is good. It'd come to me and they're like, well, we need it. We need it now. Like, Whoa, this one's going to take a while. This is a hard... This is much harder than just give me insurance right now. Um, you know, these are harder. Nobody's looked at these in years. Um, they didn't, as far as they can tell them, the mom had let the insurance lapse. They don't even know there's been insurance on the property for years. So, uh, you know, something we're working through and dealing with. Uh, we'll get it done, but it's just going to take a little bit. Um, so, you know, every case that comes in here is different, you know, when I hear, well, my friend, um, this is what a person's home, so uh, a million-dollar house we were discussing this week. And 
a person is also very, very price sensitive. Um, and they manage everything to the penny. So they call me, they send me an email, Steve, um, you know, a lot of my friends have Chubb. And I'm saying, well, you know, but we gave you the Chubb quote. You know, excellent company, love Chubb. It was the most expensive. You said, no. Okay, we gave you the Chubb quote, um, but it was 50% higher than every other quote. Great company, great coverage. We, and, and Chubb's a wonderful carrier, but this customer was very, very price sensitive and didn't want to pay for the Chubb coverage, but you know, certainly something that was offered. Um, for Chubb, you know, it kind of starts at a million dollars uh, to get in to get in that program. Um, so um, something to think about there. Um, we went over a lot. Um, I want to address the dog issue and pets. Uh, this has come up a lot. It's why I want everybody listening to this. Please, especially if there's pets, if you're allowing pets in your leases, make sure that the customer has um, renter's insurance. Um, in Maryland, it's all about dog bites. Occasionally, a carrier will want to exclude what we call an aggressive breed, whether that's a Doberman, German Shepherd, uh, especially the pit bulls. Um, most carriers will now, at least in Maryland, allow one bite. But as soon as that bite, they're going to cancel the renter's insurance. Um, we want the landlord to be made an additional insured. So if it bites somebody, that the landlord's also listed as additional insured. Um, you know, we've had customers. So so here's why. Let me tell you the claim that we had. Years ago, um, my customer landlord did not allow his tenants to have dogs. Uh, the tenants got a pit bull and went to great lengths to hide it. So every year as the landlord would come to his inspection, the dog would be gone. All the trace of the dog would be gone and it passed his inspection. Um, and then, you know, a few days later, they'd bring the dog back. And one day, the kid in the neighborhood was walking through and saw the dog at the window and wanted to pet the dog. So he opened the door of that of the apartment, uh, or in this case, the townhouse, and the dog ran out. The dog ran right out to a lady who was walking her poodle and attacked and killed the poodle. Um, again, my client, you, the landlord, knew nothing about the dog. They actually went to great lengths to hide it. The lady whose dog was killed was traumatized. You know, do you think she filed suit against the tenant? Sure. Did she file a long, a long you know, against mm -hmm. the landlord? Yep. So, you know, it's up to you whether you want to allow pets or not. Now, I do sell, once in a blue moon it comes up, dog bite liability insurance. When you have um, a dog that's bitten somebody before and they can't get renter's insurance anymore or they can't get insurance for their dog, um, they're going to pay for it. Okay, that pro that policy is probably going to be five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars a year if they want to rent from you, and we will make you the landlord an additional insured on that policy. But dog bite liability does exist. Now, what doesn't exist? We should have the discussion. Um, I get asked about this a lot. Now, it's again, it's more of a Baltimore thing. Uh, is lead paint, and you know we'll have the the lead paint liability discussion. Um, here in Maryland, over my years, I've seen what constitutes a lead paint liability claim. You know that's been going down, meaning that that what's required to to qualify as a positive reading keeps going down. So now all of a sudden, you may get a letter saying, um, you know. Jim, oh, Jim, I want to say James. Jim, um, you know, hi, we're representing uh, this client and, um, you know, they have a positive reading. Now, here's the interesting part. They'll find a kid who has a positive reading and they'll take the kid in the car and they'll drive down the street. I need you to point to every single house you, you've been in, you've walked in, you've gone in. Oh, that's grandma's house? Sir? Okay. So I've actually gone to meet with clients and I look at the number of defendants on a lead paint lawsuit. There could be 20, 30. I've, I've seen 45 or 50. They've said that the kid has walked in 50 different houses 
and they're suing all 50. Now you've got to say, there's no record of this kid ever coming in here. I don't know this kid. Well, you know, Jim, you know, we, you know, the kid says he came into your house. We'd be willing to let you off this case for $5,000 or $10,000. Um, so, you know, and think about it. They're suing 40 to 50 people at the same time. The kid says he came into your house. Now, you've had your house as part of the program. It's been determined to be lead safe. If you're buying multifamily property, especially in Baltimore City, you know, what would it take to get it to be certified lead free, you know, as opposed to lead safe? Now, there's all kinds of lead safe laws. Every time a, a tenant moves out, you have to get it reinspected. You have to refile with the MDE, Maryland Department of Environment. You can't go to evict in, I, 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 I think it's my understanding, you can't go to rent court unless you show that it's got a valid um, lead cert, et cetera. Um, but having it certified lead free, you know, if there's stuff that can be done so you can get a lead free, you know, you can say to the attorney, gee, you know, my house is certified lead free. I've owned it for these three years and it was lead free when I got it. I don't know, you know, when the kid was here, but, you know, as far since I've owned it, it's been lead free. Don't You know, he didn't get it here. Sorry. Uh, maybe that will be helpful. Okay. Um, getting lead certified, you know, lead insurance these days um, is just about done. Okay. Really can't get it. Um, so. Um, we used to be able to get something that, you know, could pay for medical expenses and moving expenses. It's, sometimes it's available if you can find it, but getting to pay attorney's fees is pretty much gone these days. Um, but it's, again, something we need to be aware of. Um, if you're buying in Baltimore City, especially lead certs, uh, you need to be aware of it. And if you can, you know, try to buy a building that's lead free as opposed to lead safe. Um, another thing that comes up, um, I did want to address is a um, some other different coverages that, that maybe people aren't aware of. If you're buying something that has a boiler, okay, and the city needs to send out, you know, to get a boiler inspection every year, um, we want to make sure that your policy has something called equipment breakdown coverage or Hartford steam boiler coverage. If it's got a boiler, it's, it's built in that they'll come out and do the inspection every year and file it with the Maryland Department of, you know, MDE and, and the steam boiler uh, associations so that they've looked at it every year. So in these bigger commercial, uh, bigger apartment buildings in Baltimore City or even in the county, you want to make sure that you have uh, equipment breakdown coverage. Another one we can talk about is what's called ordinance and law coverage. If the place burns down and I need to rebuild it according to code, now I'm going to have to put in a sprinkler system because that's code. OK, so do you have what's called ordinance and law? So as I rebuild, I've got to rebuild according to code because insurance is built on what we call the principle of indemnity. And that's going to put us back to where we were at the time of the loss. OK, and at the time of the loss, you didn't have a sprinkler system. Maybe the insulation in the house was R7 and code today is now R30. So I had, need to bump up the insulation. Okay, all kinds of stuff. Um, you know, sprinklers, maybe making you know, the building more, um, you know, you know, for handicapped individuals, maybe more handicap accessible, et cetera. So these are all things we need to consider. Um, it's a coverage ordinance and law you may want to consider. Equipment breakdown, um, another one. Um, and we'll get to this in the next section too. Um, service line coverage, one of my new favorite coverages. Um, this happens in Baltimore City a lot. Um, the stuff they pull out of the sewer systems, I, I mean, James, Nicole, can hop in here. I, you know, I've had shoes. I've had best, you name it, it's stopping up your drains. Um, and they have to get in and, and try to, you know, repair it, remove it. Um, so even if it's a if it's a package that's out in the county or the city, you know, digging it up if if roots are getting in. If you have service line coverage, you know, that's going to be five, six, seven thousand dollars to dig it up, fix it, repair it, and put the put the ground back in. Um, so if you can get it, 
service line coverage. I'm a, I'm a huge believer in it. Great coverage to have these days. If you can't get it as part of your thing, there's some services out there that sell them individually. Service line coverage, $100, $200 a year may be worth looking into. Um, so, uh, boy, we're almost out of time. You see 45 minutes just went like that. I want to leave time for, for questions and answers. Um, again, anything in terms of a multifamily we've covered, we've covered the roof. We've covered walking into it. We've covered the systems. We've covered... Uh, insurance things, you know, some ideas of coverages that you may want to ask for. We've covered Section 8. We've covered, uh, you know, all different kinds of tenants, you know, uh, things that can be asked for. Um, you also want to make sure your policy has what's called loss of rent, loss of income. So if it burns down, at least for a year, I'm going to continue to pay your rents to you while, you know, you've still got to pay a mortgage. So we're going to continue to pay your rents while we're repairing that property up to a certain amount of time. So uh, another important coverage to have. Um, again, because it's 716, I want to make sure we have, we leave it open for, for time for questions. So uh, anybody is, uh, I told uh, James, I am a min, email them questions. I'm happy to answer anything. Uh, any of the panels sitting on, on here has questions. Please shoot them out. Uh, now's the time. There's, you know, better to ask me if you don't want to ask your agent. Uh, we get this all the time. Uh, well, my agent told me, well, you know, maybe your agent isn't familiar with writing rental properties. Okay. But we write them all day long. So when they tell you no, I'm going to tell you, yes, we can do that. Um, you know, um, you know, they're just not familiar with it. Or, you know, we have to have, you know, we have, you know, all kinds of different carriers because carriers come in the market, they come out of the market, you know, depending on your specific scenario and situation. Um, everybody's situation's unique. So when you say, oh, well, my friend's only paying this per property, you know, okay, well, what coverage does he have? Is he underinsuring it? Does he have a $10,000 deductible? You know, um, you know, all kinds of stuff uh, we see. You know, I've seen people who, you know, are dramatically underinsured. Well, the only landlord was only paying $1,000 a year. Oh, for a 10-unit apartment building? Oh, he only had 100000 because he bought it 30 years ago. You're paying a million dollars for this building, <laughs> you know? I mean, what do you think we have to insure it for? It's bringing $120,000 a year rent. No, there's no $1,000 insurance policy anymore that, that you know, um, nobody looked at that insurance policy in years. Um any questions, uh, James, anything coming in? Any questions? Anybody have any questions? Uh, nothing in chat, but guys, it's a small enough group if you want to. I mean, I have a bunch of questions, but I won't let other people <laughs> ask. Um, so feel free to unmute and uh, and ask away. So this is Nicole. I do have one question. I actually have more than one, but one that I really would like to get answered. So if you have an apartment building, say this for kicks, it's 40 units. Um, and you have um, a few units that you're going to totally rehab, that you're going to take things down and redo them. Um, is there any special kind of insurance you need or can get to cover that, um, e.g. a builder's risk for that unit as opposed to the overall building? I don't know if that makes sense, but... Yeah, what, yeah it does, what, and this comes up occasionally. So if it's a... Um... The prior tenants have moved out and you're doing a ref what I'm going to call a refresh. Okay. Yeah. We yeah, get I'm some at, of that. I'm uh, actually talking about, you a know, more, a more correct. in depth. So a lot of, you know, I've got people buying units right now and in order to get the rents up as a tenant moves out, they're bringing in a crew and they're putting in new cabinets. They're redoing the plumbing. They're putting in a new kitchen and stuff like that. The whole job itself um, is usually pretty quick, Nicole, something that's 30 days or less. Yeah. They get the team in, they get it done, they, et cetera. Um, and, and that's what we kind of want to stick to. Um, we would try to hope, you know, we would hope that the contractors you're using have insurance. And again, making, you know, your unit an additional insured for, you know, if uh, they accidentally... Oh God, they tap into the plumbing and all of a sudden, you know, water goes down and we've got all kinds of claims going down. So, you know, 
we want to make sure the contractors are properly insured. Do they have the right insurance? Have they made you an additional insured, et cetera? Um, you, typically, we want to get them in and out. If it's something that's going to be three, four, five months, I got to notify the carrier. and We got to have that discussion with the carrier and see what they want. Uh, but typically, what I'm seeing from my clients um, is that um, it, it, it's something quicker, you know, depending on okay. what you're asking. Um, All right. I do have had a situation where um, they were doing um, a, a little bit different way. Um, they're doing a massive renovation in the building, really renovating the building, but they've started leasing up part of the phase that's done and as they're working on higher floors. Um, that all had to be written as a builder's risk and they wouldn't give it new standard insurance to at least 70, 75% of the work was done. If that makes sense. Yeah. So we had, um, this has been a couple, three years ago now, but we had um, one um, one of our apartment buildings, one of the buildings caught on fire and it was a total loss. Mm -hmm. And so there was eight units in that building and they, we had to totally redo that building. And so, and that was more than 30 days. It was like six months before. We That's going to be, done. at that point, that policy needed to be rewritten to a builder's risk insurance. You've got the base value of what it's worth. And then we need to know the dollar amount of the renovations. And we even if, even if, so this was six buildings and one of them burnt. So you still need an overall builder's risk policy. No, we would do it for that one building. Okay. Thank you. Um, I saw a question pop up, but it, 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 uh, I lost the least. I think it's a comment from Doug. Which is pretty funny. Uh, from Doug. Okay. Uh, if they install sheetrock in the bathroom, put a screw in the hot water supply line, then the ceiling in the unit below collapses a week later. Uh, this has happened <laughs> after their drywall is saturated. Ask me how I know. Well, I, you know, Doug, we, we, we've had the claim. Uh, so again, it's I, I, I beg you, the contractors you hire, we need to make sure they have certificates of insurance and that they're insured to do the work that they're doing. Okay. For that specific reason. So, um, you know, this has happened, you know, um, it, I can't stress enough that make sure you're using insured people to do your work, not a handyman that you're using on the side that doesn't have insurance. Cause that's just a mess waiting to happen. Great question, Doug. Um, James, you had some questions. Um, yes. Yeah, so um, we had a, a student um, just last week, two weeks ago. I can't remember how long it was. I think it was two weeks ago when we had the class who um, had bought an apartment building here in Baltimore. Um, but his background is that his uncle um, and a partner owned a ton of properties down in Florida. Um, and they sold off everything some years ago, except for one 32 unit building. And the insurance on the 32 unit building in Florida, I want to say it's on the coast, but not on the water. Um, for 32 units was $20,000. I think he just sent me a text $20,000 three years ago. It's now $150,000. The building, it doesn't cash flow anymore. It's like, and he can't sell it, right? Because he's going to take a loss. So how do you mitigate that risk? I mean, do people just say, hey, you know something? I'm thinking of buying this building. You know, can you give me an estimate? And one, how accurate is that estimate? Uh, and how long does it take you to kind of um, uh, send that out so someone can underwrite properly? For example, in this building, we couldn't obviously take the T12. We'd have to get a bid or else we'd be, you know, upside down. So, um, you know, being intricately familiar with Florida right now and everything that's going on, um, getting, I can tell you right now, they, you know, um, and our friends uh, listening to us from Sarasota right now, especially the Fort Myers area and, and all those carriers, Collier, Kyle, Kyle, Lee, all the way up. Um, they're no longer allowing mobile home parks within several miles of the coast. Because with the Hurricane Ian that came through, literally wiped out entire trailer parks. Gone. History leveled. Gone. Um they're just, you're just not going to be able to, you know, and they're rezoning them and they're saying, you really can't have this here with the hurricane exposure. The surge came in about two or three miles and just 
obliterated everything. Um, in your friend's case, you know, the large apartment building in Florida, um, number one, same thing um, from what we said. You know, number one, what's driving up the rate? Is it the roof? Number one, do we need to, you know, you know, this is one where you need to, you know, he needs to go and he needs to get a second opinion or a third opinion from another agent that can write there. You know, is it the roof? How old's that roof? Is the building building elevated? Is it the flood zone? Um, you know, um, everything just like a house, you know, how old how old that roof is. And it may make sense to replace the whole roof to get lower insurance for the future. Um, what's driving the rate up? I can't change the location, but I can change certain things. So if it, like I said, if it's the roof and the nails that are in there and all kinds of stuff like that, um, you know, there's things that maybe could be done to try to lower that and also bidding it out. Um, you know, taking a high deductible. What what deductible is it? You know, um, maybe it's a fifty thousand dollar deductible. You know, something high. You know, um, you know, there's there's all kinds of things you know that can be done, um, maybe to get that down. Um, so typically, on an apartment building, you know, um, you know, we just had one here in Baltimore. Now, um, it was sixteen units, and the insurance went from you know, 10, 11, 12,000 to 16,000. The owner was beside himself. I said, no, sir, that's a thousand dollars a unit. Okay. By the way, these were townhouses and, 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 uh, AC, if you're listening, listen, it was a whole street, two, two different sides of the street. Okay. But he had re got rehab them and they were beautiful. And I said, if you came to me and asked me to insure a single family townhouse in Baltimore city right now, as we get into the seven thirty stuff, I mean, they run about a thousand, eleven, twelve hundred. This is right what the market is. Your days of paying seven, six to seven hundred are probably gone. Okay, now you're at a thousand. That's about right. And as he looked into it, he found I was right, and he renewed the policy. I told him to keep the policy, uh, but we did bid it out to other companies. There was nothing that was a whole lot less. You know, again, Baltimore City next to each other. It limited my carriers that I could go to. Um, you know, but typically something like that. You know, you know, hey, Steve, this is required next week. I got a big apartment building. You know, hard to do. You know, the more leverage you give guys like me, that you know, the more time, you know, we'll look at the losses and make the, present the case, the better off we're going to be. Is there a rule of thumb or like a, somebody showed me a website. I can't remember where it was, but it kind of gave you a very rough estimate of what ranges were for apartment building units per unit prices in different areas. Do you, have you heard of that before or is that I, just that, that is, uh, not um, a good site? It, it sounds great, you know, yeah. but it's just not something that really makes any sense. Like I said, brick frame, how right. old is the hat? You know, it just, it doesn't yeah. work. I've, I point. have got it, not got it. Mm -hmm. Fired, you know, sprinklers, sprinkler credits, what type of tenants? I mean, it's really hard to say, right? You know, the That's better the point. unit, the better, the more I can present, you know, the better picture I can present with underwriter, you know, the better off we're going to be. Awesome. That's my take. Okay. But, but generally, you know, to do it right is, you know, my underwriters work three to four weeks out. So, so mm -hmm. three to four weeks, you know, especially. Right. Okay. So. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Oh, here's a question from Doug. Doug's always thinking, what is happening to the land if they are no longer allowing trailer parks, which are really mobile home parks, by the way, Doug, just so you know. Okay. Land doesn't burn down. So um, typically, um, and, and Collier and Lee counties are just a mess in Florida right now. Uh, the land is there. Um, in some of the trailer parks, you may not have owned the land, you know, somebody else owned the land and the county's coming in and people have lost their homes. Those who had insurance on their, on their mobile, home, mobile home got paid. Others that didn't lost everything. They just lost it all. You self-insured and you lost. Uh, but they're, they're rezoning that um, because it's just too high risk for uh, mobile homes. You're not going to be able to build mobile homes anywhere inside five miles of the coast. Can the people that have the mobile home parks um, insure against 
something like that a reuse because it, I would assume it's worth a lot more as a mobile home park park than it is rezoned to single family. Does that make sense? It does, but the county's not going to allow you to do it. The county's the county's changing it after after seeing all these mobile home parks wiped out. Well, I guess could and it, it, it's probably never going to affect me, but could they insure against? losing that particular use uh that that zoning to a no. uh... at the end of the day you know the policy that they had may have had one year loss of rents you know depending on what they had um and at the end of the day after that you know um you know depending on the zoning you know um that's when, at that point, you're probably selling to a developer, you know, yeah. maybe even a national builder that's going to come in and pay because people want people want to be there on a house and they'll build raised houses and that meet code and all that kind of fun stuff. So, um, you know, that's probably where that's going. Uh, the mobile home parks, they'll be rezoned into single family residences and, and home builders will come in and pay a premium for the land. Well, as one of those people who owns a lot of mobile home parks, I, I think what I would start looking at doing, if that was me, would be to actually um, put those homes on a on a slab foundation, just like it was a foundation, and um, and get them surveyed off and call them because you can turn those homes into single family homes. They just need to be on a foundation and tied down like a regular home, like a modular. And I think you'd get around it that way. There's going to be building codes there and they'll come in with the flood zone and what the flood zone is. And you're going to have yeah. to build that property above the flood zone. So it's not just that it's a manufactured housing community. It's other things as well. You know, the county saw everybody wiped out. So the, the county's going to yeah. say, that, you know, our base flood level, I'm going to say six feet. You know, the, the flood came up five feet and, you know, depending where they were. So what um, are they doing with single family houses that got wiped out or in that um, same? Depending on whether they had flood insurance, but they can't force you to rebuild for single family, but they can take the whole trailer park and tell you we're rezoning it to single family and that, you know, subject to new building codes and everything has to be built above the, you know, based on the building code has to be built, you know, above, you know, that grade. So as I see new construction going up in Sarasota, Fort Myers, Everything is, you know, you've got five, six, seven, eight steps to yeah. get up to get to your to your place. And and people are building building an elevator to get up in the houses and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, you know, so I'm gonna be interesting to see how that plays out in the courts because I can't believe that um that that's gonna fly easy. Well, you also had in the condominiums, you know, the condominium yeah. collapsed in in uh so so Condominiums right now, uh, uh, you know, big condos, big apartment buildings, they're really looking at them, Nicole. And if, yeah. you know, um, that's just a whole, you know, it, companies are very sensitive to what happened in, uh, you know, that collapse. And yeah. uh, I think it was Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. Um, the whole first floors and, and things like that. Um you know, we'll see where it goes, but uh, I mean, a place like Florida is not going to be real forgiving about it. Um, so don't uh, buy manufactured housing communities in Florida. Or just in, jack in, in way inland, but not coastal. So I mean, the villages, maybe, you know, inland Orlando, hmm. um, possibly. Um, but it's just it's just what I'm seeing. Yeah. Um, I see how the counties have changed their building codes. Or just jack them all up and have market covered parking. Yeah. Covered no, there you go. <laughs> it's a great yeah. idea. It's 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 a strange market what's going on. Um but it is like I said, it is what it is. Um and I get it. So so right now we, you know, we have uh you know, we're talking to people who are buying on the water in Naples or, you know, these five and $10 million houses. They cannot get flood insurance right now. No. Yeah, it was really interesting. I was just down in Myrtle Beach and we saw a house being built right on the, you know, right on the beach. And they were actually putting in steel framing 
So everything was, I mean, it was significantly um, expensive framing. We didn't discuss it, but, you know, also if you're building on a cliff, you know, you got a big, beautiful cliff house, you, you know, those days yeah. are, are um, you see the stuff going on in California. That's I, kind of crazy what's going on there. I noticed in Pete's neighborhood, I was last time I was at a seminar down there. Madeira Beach area. Um, they were jack taking houses, slab houses, and jacking them up a full story. Yep. A little ranch slab house. And there's a company, I got their their picture, but they're going around in neighborhoods and jacking them up one full story. I and I don't know about the cost of all that and what they're gaining, but it's, I saw it happening. Well, as I like to tell people, we've got hundred year floodplains, you know, properties that aren't supposed to flood at all suddenly getting flooded so um you know that's what's going on they're going to make you get flood insurance if you can uh, i talked to a realtor in sanibel uh some friends of ours who were retired moved down there one month before the hurricane oh, just moved into their house and it got wiped out uh, 60 percent of it you know literally uh one month after they moved in it took them a year to get it habitable again I'm wondering if places like Florida, like a, my brother-in-law had a house in Bethany and they did that. They raised it an entire um, uh, level, put it on um, pilings um, and Bethany paid for it. I think it would pay like 80% or something like that of the cost or whatever it is. So I'm wondering if if Florida might have the same kind of program and is it only if, if you're a homeowner or could it be if you are a landlord? I don't know. I mean, so so I can't speak for Bethany, but I can speak for Fenwick. Fenwick has as you as you you walk down, uh, it's called Bunting, which is right on the beach there, and you see houses that are all the new ones are built up. Yep. Okay, but you have some old ones that are grandfathered in, that are not that are on you know, and you can never add on. You can never uh, do much to them because if you did, it, now it's new code and you can't build up so they can't increase the size of it they can't do anything to it mm -hmm. you know, if but if you knocked it down you built a new new house you had to build it up on stilts and some people do that but some people don't want to spend that kind of money right so yeah. they can't ever increase the value of those those homes in fenwick it's kind of interesting